Well, welcome to uh, another get together of uh, Chris, Daryl, and Paul. That's Chris Pedersen, Daryl Balls, and Paul Merriman here to help you by answering your questions that came out of one of the finest presentations I have ever seen on the internet. And that was a presentation for AAII, the American Association of Individual Investors. And Chris Pedersen made that presentation. Chris, by chance, do you have the title page for your presentation? Because I want people to see that because I'm hoping uh, that you will, if you didn't see it, go see it because truly it's one of the best I've seen. Simple and effective balanced portfolios for lifetime investing success. And the fact is most of us uh, have got balanced portfolios and uh, that may apply uh, more than the all equity portfolio that I made in the previous AAII presentation. But out of Chris's presentation came a whole bunch of questions. And uh, so we're going to dedicate one of our uh, podcasts here, and uh, it will also be a YouTube piece uh, to the things that people wanted to know. So Chris and Daryl, thank you so much for joining me again. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read these uh, questions. And by the way, I would wish that you could have been there when the three of us discussed these, because just having sat through that give and take that we went through about these questions, they're all important, uh, would be an education unto itself. So here's the first question. What withdrawal strategies do you recommend? And then he goes on to say, should or she, should I take equally from each fund or draw from the one that has grown the most? So let me take the first part of this, guys, and, and uh, uh, talk about the withdrawal strategies we recommend. If you haven't been to our website, paulmerriman.com, and there's a section entitled Best Advice. It's one of the links at the top of the page. You go to Best Advice, and there's a drop down, and one of the things you'll come to is the Distribution 2020 link. That will take you to over 60 tables uh, representing the assumption that you invested starting in 1970, the 50 years worth of data taking out either on a fixed basis or a variable basis, taking out 3%, 4%, 5 or 6 using an all S&P 500 along with fixed income or an all value or a worldwide this or that and 70, 30 and 50, 50 all of these different combinations so that you can compare the implications of how much you take out, whether you force yourself to raise the amount each other year by inflation, or you take a percentage of whatever's left at the end of each year. These are all different philosophies or approaches that you could study. And uh, that then is for you to try to figure out what amongst those tables represents your likely financial future? Not an easy task, but that's what we're trying to do to help investors. But then there's the question here, should I take equally from each fund or draw from the one that uh, has grown the most? Uh, Daryl, do you wanna take that on? Sure. Um, I would not, think you should take from the necessarily from the one that has grown the most. I would use uh, distributions from your portfolio to rebalance the whole portfolio. So you would look at what your asset allocation should be or your sub asset allocation should be. And it takes from the takes from the rich and gives to the poor. But you sort of have to figure out what's what's my balance after I take out what I need and then redistribute that across your asset allocation to figure out how much you need to take from each separate little piece. Um, there was another part to this question about how do RMDs change things. Mm -hmm. And in, at the top level, I don't think they 
think I don't think they change things. Um, they they change the implementation a little bit about how you go about it in terms of the details, because now you've got to look at your portfolio as a whole between both your tax advantage accounts or your tax deferred accounts and your your taxable account accounts. And so you need to figure out how much you need to take out. What does that make your whole portfolio balance be? How does your asset allocation spread across that new balance? And then you take from the from the pieces that are above that balance. Um, and if you need to, you can move some into the other balances uh, in your in your taxable account. Um, now, now Daryl, if I that sounds like a, a lot of work uh, or a lot of moving parts. What does that take you each year for you, for that decision yourself? Um, I have not started RMDs yet, so I don't know. <laughs> to, be show honest, <laughs> to be honest, um, I'm not quite that old yet. Well, they changed the, They moved the line, right? They moved the line. So that gives me a little bit more. Yeah. But um, I, I don't think it is, I don't think it's going to be that difficult, but then I'm a numbers person. So uh, if it's if it's an individual who's not a numbers person, uh, I you could just keep it balanced at the at the top level. If you have more in stocks than you want, take it all from the stocks. If you have if your bonds are more than you want, take it all from the bonds, or just stick between that. And that uh, in the grand scheme of things, I think some of the work that Chris has done shows that it. If you don't rebalance your equity portfolio at all, it doesn't really make much difference. So which particular sub-asset classes you take it from probably isn't as important as keeping your stocks and equity, stocks and bonds balance. That would be the simplest. Okay, thank you. Uh, number two, with the two funds for life approach of 1.5 times your age work the same with a U.S. total market fund and a U.S. small cap value fund? Well, let me explain just a little bit. Uh, Chris did in his presentation talk about the two funds for life, but the uh, person here, I think, uh, is talking about not using a target date fund and a second fund, but instead building a portfolio of an equity fund, eliminating fixed income completely from the portfolio and a second fund, maybe only doing that up until their point there, maybe 40 or 45 or 50, and then start adding the fixed income to the portfolio. So Chris, what would the difference be, uh, the, the approach uh, using an equity fund and a second fund like small cap value? You know, in the early years, you're going to have uh, the advantage that you don't carry a lot of bonds. You're, you're not going to be looking at uh, the 10% bonds that a Vanguard uh, portfolio would have. So that's, that's, uh, that's going to give you a little bit higher return, a little bit less diversification, a little bit deeper drawdown. Uh, for a young person, that's probably a good set of trade-offs, especially if they can stick with it and they've got dollar cost averaging working for them to reduce the drawdowns anyway. As they get older, I think it becomes more problematic because you, you really have given up a fundamental part of the two funds for life. You, you no longer have a glide path that is adjusting risk for age, even though you might transition from a a uh, more volatile asset class and small cap value into a total market fund, that difference just isn't very great compared to transitioning into a fund that has substantial investment in fixed income. So I, I, I'm not saying it would produce a bad result. It might produce an, an okay result, but the person taking that approach really isn't taking a two funds for life approach. They're taking an all equity approach and just saying they're going to vary. In fact, they're going to reduce their diversification as they get older because they're going to go from an approach that has diversification across the market risk factor, the size risk factor, and the value risk factor to being all market eventually. And 
And so I, I don't like it as a, a strategy for somebody between the age of 40 and 65. Um, I, I would prefer if somebody was looking for an all equity strategy to go the full course, that they invest in something that's a more diversified portfolio. And then they've got training wheels on in the early years because they've got the dollar cost averaging helping them out. And as they grow into becoming accustomed to the full drawdowns that they might experience in bad market times, they're building the calluses to handle it when they get closer to retirement. And if they've oversaved at that point, it may be fine to stick with it. Uh, but you know, you probably have to oversave by a factor of two to live with mm -hmm. an all equity strategy through retirement, because you always have that risk out there that you're going to have half the money tomorrow that you had today. And if you can live on half the money comfortably and you can endure the risk, maybe that works for you. Right. But so um, what, yeah, it's a different so strategy. Chris, what's the, what's the, the latest that you think somebody wants to be more aggressive, but still is committed to putting the fixed income on the table later, would you let them go till age 50 before they start adding the fixed income? Because, you know, that gives them 15 years, theoretically, maybe 20 to have the right amount of fixed income when they retire. Uh, you know, we created the Merriman aggressive glide path for people who want to be very aggressive and and uh, I modeled it many, many different times, trying to figure out whether we were being too aggressive uh, or whether we were coming up with something that tested positively through all 600 of the histories we could test it through. I think that's as aggressive, for somebody who wants to ramp their risk down nearing retirement, that's as aggressive as I would recommend. So they could go take a look at that. And it starts in the 40s to in introduce a small amount of fixed income and then increase it to... Mm -hmm. I think we end up at a 50-50 uh, uh, fixed income and equities around age 65. So I, I would, you know, if you think about it from the standpoint of somebody who's uh, going to work as long as they can, 65 is not that far from age 40, 45. You're down to 20 years you, and, and it gets progressively your your human capital declines non-linearly right it accelerates because you got two things you have fewer years to work and fewer years for compounding to help you out and the longer you wait the the deeper a hole you've dug if you if something bad happens um, yeah i would unless unless you know you're going to oversave and you can have twice what you need i'd start reducing risk in those 40s okay okay good news Okay, number three, what percent of people can sustain a system when hitting a 50% drawdown? And this is one of the things you talked about, it, Chris, in your presentation was the drawdowns that people have to be willing to accept with a different amounts of, uh, of equity. And I just got to insert one thing here. I, I can't believe how many people in my career in the industry we're scared to death of a 50% drawdown or the idea of being there for a severe bear market, let alone a 22.5% one day loss as we had on October 19th, 1987. So they're scared to death of losing 50%. And yet you'll look at their portfolio and what's it filled with? Mutual funds with high expenses, mutual funds with active management, mutual funds with tax inefficiencies. I can't say guarantee, but likely to lead not just to a 50% lower return over their lifetime, but a permanent loss of 50%, as opposed to the 50% we're talking about in a bear market has rarely ever been permanent. Of course, we've got to remember Japan. It, 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 has, it has stuck around a long time uh, in the basement. So that kind of 50% drawdown is, uh, uh, is just part of the process. But who wants to take a bite at this about, about um, uh, people being able to sustain a 50% drawdown? Who might that be? Daryl, do you know that person? <laughs> Well, I probably know a couple of them, but um, I think th the question as to what percent of people can handle it is I'm I'm I don't know the answer to that. I would 
postulate that more people think they can handle it than probably can handle it. And the reason I say that is because I, I'm not sure that everyone sits down and actually has a really um, heart to heart talk with themselves about their ability, willingness and need to take risk. Um, that's, that's the Larry Swedro mantra. And, uh, and I think it's actually a pretty good one. Um, there's a good description of it on the Bogleheads wiki site if you wanna go look at it. But, but your ability to take risk factors in things like your time horizon, the liquidity of your, uh, or the need for your liquidity for what to meet your expenses, how stable your income is, and also to your personality to a certain extent on how flexible you are to adapt uh, if there's no plan B. Um, willingness, willingness is really characterized by uh, how much you need to eat well and how much you need to sleep well. So you kind of need to trade trade off those two uh, in terms of return uh, versus, uh, versus withdrawal rates, let's say. Um, and the need to take, take risk uh, is sort of defined by what kind of rate of return do you need to meet whatever you, you think your, your ending, end up goal is, um, ending goal is. Uh, so it's important to go through and assess what your, what your risk posture is or your risk profile is. Um, as far as the people who can sustain a, a drawdown like that, um, I think it's people who, in large part, who have sustained drawdowns before, maybe not 50%, but, but maybe a bear market or two. And so they, they've got, as Chris mentioned earlier, they've got the calluses to deal with it. So um, I, think, I think that's important. Um, I, don't, I don't know how else to, to set yourself up for that. Um, one analytical way to look at it is Chris has a table in his presentation that he made to AAII that talks about drawdowns when you're and, and puts them in the context of when you're making contributions, uh, particularly early on. A 50% drawdown early on is not nearly as bad as a 50% drawdown at the end of your portfolio. And that's part of the reason why you move from equities to bonds, I think. Um, and so that's an interesting, interesting thing to look, to look at. Um, the mere fact that this question was asked leads me to wonder whether or not the person that asked the question is one of the people that can sustain that kind of a hit. So yeah, it's kind you of, know, if you have to ask the question, the answer is no. Kind of thing. These but, questions came to us as you know they were typed into a browser window, and uh, you could read this, and I think it was probably intended this way with a little bit of a snarkiness, you know, what percent of, of people can sustain a system when hitting a 50% withdrawal down? It was, I, you could read it with disbelief. And I agree with you, Daryl, that I, I think this person was uh, just looking at the chart saying I couldn't, right? You know, that was, that was the way I read it. Yeah. Well, I think uh, a lot of people will conclude they're willing to lose it if they think there's a ton of money to be made when I when I saw this question, it 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 reminded me of the article that Morningstar wrote years ago about CGM Focus, a mutual fund that had a phenomenal track record for a decade. Uh, as a matter of fact, for for the ten years ending, I think sometime in two thousand nine, its compound rate of return was seventeen point eight percent. So people were chasing that fund like mad, but they tracked the cash flow in and out of that fund. And the, 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 the return for the shareholders who bought it was a negative 16.8% a year for, for that 10 uh, year uh, period. And so these were people who thought they could accept the volatility in order to get the huge return. But guess what? It turned out they were bailing out at market bottoms and being very attractive to it when, when it was up and making a lot of money. And that, of course, is one of the biggest challenges for investors is to stay out of that process. One, right, one, one other thing, Paul, Sure. about this is, that, and I remember this from when you, you gave your seminars, low these many years ago. And that's one thing to think about when, when you talk about percentages of drawdowns, when you say to somebody, would you be willing to lose 
50% of your portfolio for a while, even if you knew it was gonna come back and you say, oh yeah, I would be able to do that. I, can, I think I can handle that. And then you say, okay, well, assume you have a $2 million portfolio, would you be okay with losing a million dollars? And they would say, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. sometimes it's important to look not at the percentage necessarily, but in terms of the dollars that you're talking about when you're assessing your willingness to take the risk. Yes. A million dollars buys a lot of meals at Denny's, you know, if you're retired. So. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay, number four, why does the Trev H perform just as well as the four fund combo? Uh, when last month, Paul said the four fund combo outperformed Trev H. Uh-oh, I've been caught in a lie. <laughs> no, it's not a lie at all. Chris, do you want to explain why I said one thing and you said another? Uh, well, we should probably start for listeners on the podcast, reminding them what the difference between the two is. The four fund combo is the, the four corners of the stock market in the US. So the four fund combo is large blend, uh, large value, small blend, small value, all in the US. And the Trev H substitutes uh, two of those for international funds. So it still has uh, the large blend in the US, but it's got large value international. And it's still got small value in the US, but small blend international. And so obviously the Trev H is worldwide diversified where the four fund combo is all US. And when Daryl and you did the paper last month, you only used the history going back to, uh, I believe it was 1990, right, Daryl? Correct. Yeah, and, and that's because that's where we have uh, real return data going going back that's firm and, and hard and easy to get at. And, and when I say easy, I mean, you know, with hours and hours of Daryl's diligent time, it's not <laughs> trivial to analyze it. Uh, but we've also been working on extending some of those asset classes farther back in time. And when I did my paper this month, I used something uh, that, that relied on uh, additional asset class history to extend it back to 1970. And some of that required um, some clever substitution and relying on some new resources that were available external uh, to the ones we normally have used. And uh, you can just look at the return history. If you go back to 1970, uh, public sources will tell you the international market benefited from that period of time from then to 1990. And so by going farther back in time, uh, the internationals did better and the difference between the two becomes almost insignificant. Uh, and so it's, it's basically just different return histories, different periods of time. Will either of them be the perfect predictor of the future? No, um, we don't have any perfect predictors of the future. Uh, is a longer history generally better? I, I think so. I like the longer history. Um, so I, I think that's the difference. Fundamentally, just different period of time. So, so let's talk uh, Turkey about this all US versus the 50-50 US international. And I personally, my wife and I, we are in the equity part of our buy and hold portfolio, half US, half international. Uh, and that's there for a reason. But, but the difference in long-term return, uh, we see that it's the very little. And, and with one year, one year more performance could change that to, to be equal again. So the, there's not much difference in performance so it is about risk management that with the U.S. and the international, we've added more asset classes. We've got currency diversification. But how big a deal is all of that? I mean, is there a way, is there a way to, to, to put a number to it or a, or a percentage to it or anything that would say it's a huge advantage if you just take this one last step? and add the internationals. Yeah, I don't think there's a way to say it's a huge return advantage. Um, I think, I think uh, maybe another way to ask the question, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, Paul, but you know, we, we look back and 
uh, evaluate the value of the premiums from small in value. They don't always deliver, but we can go through the ups and downs of small in value versus the market overhaul, overall back to 1928. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that it's sometimes behind and sometimes ahead, but over the long haul, it's very much ahead. And, and even when it falls behind, a lot of times it doesn't fall so far behind to make up for the other times it got ahead. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a squiggly line that is slowly separating from the stock market over time. And because these ups and downs have repeated many, many times and generally been to the advantage of somebody who invests in things that are smaller, smaller and cheaper, we say that looks like a good long-term trend. When we look back at U.S. versus international, it's a very different picture. You know, there's decades where the U.S. did well, decades where it was best, decades where it wasn't. Um, you know, in the U.S. versus international, it did better than international on average over 100 years. But there's not that same kind of pattern where they, they fall behind and get ahead. And then, you know, there's this constant kind of separation of the two. Um, I think it's I think it's less obvious that any of the countries, U.S. or otherwise, is going to be the right bet for the next 50 years or 100 years or 20 years. Um, I, I'd be interested, Daryl. Do you have a different view of that, or uh... I do not. Okay. Um, I've I've looked at at the telltale chart of international versus U.S. and and yeah, there are times when when one race is ahead of the other, and there are times when the other one catches up with the one that was ahead, or depending on how you want to look at it. And, um, and you know, they, it doesn't get very far away from one, okay, as you go across. They, they go above and below, but they're just, they're moving about this same mean. So if you think about, about the mean in terms of reversion to the mean, when you're talking about U.S. and international, it's pretty close to a straight horizontal line that's about one over long periods of time, like you were saying. Not quite the same with small small uh, cap value versus uh, the market, total market. Um, but, you know, is international gonna improve returns? It's not been a good decade or so, maybe, maybe more for, for international. Are they gonna improve in the future? Uh, probably, but I'm not gonna guarantee it. Um, will the Trev H outperform the four fund in the future? Maybe, but no guarantees. Again, it depends, I think, on your diversification philosophy in terms of whether you want to include things like that to, to help provide additional diversification across your, your portfolio. The one thing I would caution people against is that if you say, I'm not investing in, in uh, international because it's done so poorly over the last 10 years is right. that's Wrong. that's a, to me that's almost a form of performance chasing um you have to really think about what you're doing and have some fundamental reasons for for doing what you're doing rather than just the fact that it's had lousy returns recently that's the old future return or past returns are no guarantee of future returns so so the difference I mean, the, the difference in there then is we look at stocks over bonds expect a premium we look at small over large, expect a premium. We look at value over growth, at least historically, expect a premium. We don't really expect a premium from adding internationals. Or, from, or from being exclusively U.S. Right. It, correct. Uh, correct. Yes. But my point is, it's not about adding more return. No. It is really about having more diversification, almost like REITs. REITs, do, do, when we do the ultimate buy and hold strategy, REITs add one-tenth of 1% 1 to the portfolio where they come into the portfolio. So th that's not a game changer. It's a little extra money at the end, but not a game changer. But it doesn't go up and down at the same time as the other U.S. equity markets do. And that's the reason we have it there, which would, I guess, it would be a similar reason that one might have the internationals. Now, Chris, you look like you're looking for a table right now, are you? Nope. Oh, okay, I can go on. All right, thanks. Here we are, number five. 
What about mid-cap funds? In other words, where are the mid-cap funds? Well, this is one we've talked about a number of times, but basically mid-cap funds are just fine if you wanna have them in your portfolio. But the reason they were excluded uh, way back when, when we developed this strategy, the ultimate buy and hold strategy, was that we were rebalancing as part of the process. And so in the, 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 the book, uh, Live It Up uh, Without Outliving Your Money, a uh, book that we wrote in uh, 2005, I think, my favorite part of that book is a series of bar charts that show different periods of time. This came out of the work of dimensional funds. And what DFA would do was they would show you the returns over a particular period of time for the 10 deciles of size of companies uh, on the American, on the New York Stock Exchange. Well, no, actually in the US market, not, not just uh, the New York Stock Exchange. And so you could see over these periods of time, how did the smallest companies do? And then the next 10% and then the 30, 40, all the way up to the very largest companies in deciles. And from 65 to 68, the S&P 500 was up about 60%. The mid caps around 100%. Small caps up over 300%. So during that period of time, you could see that, boy, if I could have just been in small caps, I would have made a lot more money. But we're recommending that there's rebalancing going on. So you're taking, as Daryl said earlier, from the rich and you're giving to the poor. But... What happened from 1969 to 74? The S&P 500 was down 20%. The mid caps were down 50%. The small caps were down 70%. So you went from a, a period of time where the small caps ruled the roost to a period of time they ruined the roost. And so this is the, you know, the back and forth of this market that, that is appealing in terms of rebalancing is that you're in fact taking from the, the, the asset classes that are pouring or giving extra returns. Just take you through one more period. From 75 to 83, the S&P 500 was up about 250, 250%. The mid cap about 800%. The small cap about 12, over 1200%. So First, it was the best, then it was the worst, and then it was the best again. Well, you can, you can feel that, that, that rebalancing, taking from something that's done spectacularly, putting the excess money into the thing that's struggling, and then it comes back. You don't get the same rebalancing impact from using mid-cap as you do from being out at the edges. That was why the strategy was to be at the edges. Now, having said that, Chris, when you put together a portfolio and there's big cap and small cap and in the portfolio, are you picking up some mid cap in that portfolio? Well, we did in the best in class. Uh, we have one fund uh, that is, because there, there wasn't a large, deeply discounted value fund available. So we have a a, a mid cap fund that sits in that space for us. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, from a purist standpoint, you'd say, well, your portfolio calls for a large cap value fund. You don't have a large value, but when you combine it with all of the other funds that make up the best in class recommendations for the, for the ultimate buy and hold, it produced a, a spread across all the different Morningstar style boxes or a distribution from large to small and value to growth that was very similar to what DFA's portfolio has. And so we thought, ah, oh, that's, you know, it, it may not have the right words around it. It's a little bit of a compromise, but from it, for people investing in the whole portfolio, it's a good thing. Uh, but I agree with the rationale. Uh, you know, ideally, if you have the things on the corners, then when you rebalance, you're not wasting time by selling things that overlap to buy things that overlap, right? It's better if they're, they're more out towards the edges. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Can I determine which factors each of my stocks 
and bonds fall into. Chris, this is this is your baby. Yeah, this one this one is a little bit tricky. Uh, if you if you want to know for any individual stock or bond, you kind of need to look at what's the market cap of the company, what's its price to book, and then go compare it to say a small cap value funds market average market cap or price to book. And you can, you can get there that way. But I think for most people, they're going to have more than one stock or more than one bond. And for them, the Morningstar x-ray tool is really powerful. You can go in and you can type in your portfolio. You can enter each of your holdings and then you can run the x-ray tool and it will tell you how your portfolio distributes or sits on the Morningstar style boxes. And you can look at that then and compare it if you want to the best in class uh, funds that we've put up and the portfolio spread that we got there. Uh, so that, that's for people who hold individual stocks or individual bonds, maybe they've had them for a long time and they didn't want to sell them because of tax reasons. Uh, I, think, I think that's an excellent tool for figuring it out. It takes a little bit of time, not a huge amount of time, but uh, it's, it's a way for you to find out, you know, whether you are already, you know, whether you already have a tilt towards value or, or size or not. And if you already do, then maybe you can augment that with a smaller number of funds to balance it out and get the look that you want. Uh, if it's all in tax deferred accounts, you can just sell it and buy what you want. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. So. You know, this just came into my mind and I, and we've not talked about this, but wouldn't it be wonderful? In fact, maybe people would even email info at paulmerriman.com and vote for if they wish to have it done. Wouldn't it be cool to have a, a YouTube piece where you explained or maybe Daryl does this as well, how to use Morningstar to get the kind of information that helps us understand how these mutual funds are, are built. Could that be a project for the year 2024? <laughs> I, I think that would be fun. We also need to do the how to how to uh, use M1 pies. Um, which oh, yes. Now, yes. That one's pretty simple, but I, I think it's a good one. Um, yeah, they're both kind of sitting on the other side of updating the best in class ETF yes. recommendations right now for me. Yeah. But yeah, they're good That's things. Great. It's going to be a great year. Okay. Uh, uh, number seven, as someone that follows a very Boglehead oriented approach, simplicity, mostly VTSAX, what would your suggestion be for introducing some of these factor value oriented uh, asset classes, uh, approaching, adding them to the portfolio without blowing my port, my entire portfolio up. Boy, I, 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 that was terrible, but you got it. What do you do if you want to test the waters and use some factor investing? Well, one of the things you could do is if you're still in the phase of your retire or your investing life, and you're still contributing is you could contribute to the, the small or the value factor um, with your new contributions. Uh, that way you're not, you're not really, you're not selling anything from your existing holdings to do that. Um, and you'll still move slowly or gradually into that new, uh, new tilt for your portfolio. If you're not contributing, um, then one of the things you could do, depending on this, this will depend a little bit on the structure of your portfolio, but you could take your dividends and capital gains distributions or, your, or the, uh, the results of your tax loss, tax loss harvesting uh, activities that generate, may generate some cash. Um, and you could put those in the separate uh, value fund or, or whatever factor you want to tilt towards. Um, depending on the size of your portfolio, those could take a while to generate uh, a reasonable tilt, um, but you won't be blowing up your portfolio. Uh, so I think that's I think that's one way to do it. That's uh, I, I like that, Daryl. I guess a, a question for Chris because uh, Chris, you analyzed 
uh, the risk and return of adding these factors. Uh, how much difference was there in terms of, since the concern is blowing up the portfolio, if you've got 10% in, in value, small cap value, what change in the drawdown, the maximum drawdown that we've seen uh, came with that compared to the tr more traditional portfolio? Uh, not, not very much. You know, you're talking, if you have an all equity portfolio, uh, the expected worst case drawdowns around 51%, an all small cap value portfolio, worst case might be 60. Uh, I don't think it's quite that high, but it's, you know, in that ballpark. So uh, there's a 10 percentage point difference yeah. between the two. And if you've only got 10% in it, you're only going to see 1% of it, right? So uh, a... I really like Daryl's suggestion of, of slowly dipping your toe in the water and getting some experience with it. The other thing is we know from the presentation you and Daryl made with the telltale charts last month that you might wait 20 years for your ship to come in, for the premium to arrive, right? Well, if, if you have taken a small part of your portfolio and set it aside and said, I know this is a long-term bet for a better return, it's probably not going to bother you five years in or 10 years in that, that it is just muddling along. Uh, and so you can, you're more likely to stick with it. I, I think, I think that's a, that's a great, great way to do it. That's a good point. Number eight. And I'll tell you, uh, Daryl hauled out some tables on this one and I know he's going to haul them out here for you. Uh, and, uh, and both Chris and I enjoyed them, uh, a lot. And the question is, what mix of assets are suggested for a retiree with a goal of asset preservation, which keeps up with inflation? So, uh, Daryl, I'd love for you to share with them what you shared with us. I think they'll enjoy that information. Okay. Um, I'll try to be pithy. Um, one of the, one, I guess the first thing is, is that if, if you're, if you're not taking any withdrawals, then just sticking everything in a tips allocation would do it. Okay. It's not going to, it's not going to grow, but it'll stay there. So, uh, so that's one way to do it. If you are taking withdrawals, then it gets a little bit more complex. Um, because this, this retiree has a different goal or different objective than a lot of retirees, maybe even most retirees. Most retirees, their goal is to not run out of money. And so what they are concerned about is, and if they have to take money from their portfolio, it's they're cons more concerned about something called a safe withdrawal rate or a sustainable withdrawal rate. How much can I take out? And in the traditional way this is looked at, just for inflation every year to maintain the value of what I take out. Um, how much can that be year after year after year? That's not really what this, this individual is asking about. What they want to do is they, they want to not reduce the value of their portfolio. So they are looking at something that in, in financial literature, um, and again, this is maybe where the financial words are not quite the same as the real English words, but in the financial literature, this is called a perpetual withdrawal rate. And what that means is that if you have a certain time horizon, say 30 years, your perpetual withdrawal rate is one that will give you at the end of that 30 years, the same value you had at the start of that 30 years. It's not perpetual in the sense of eons or centuries, but it's perpetual in what you define your time horizon. To be. So I have a little something here that I will try to get through and be pithy about it. <laughs> so can you guys see this? Yeah, we got you. Yeah. Okay. So this is a little short tutorial. I hope it will be very short on perpetual withdrawal rates versus sustainable withdrawal rates and how those vary with your asset class selection, your asset allocation that is bond versus equity and your time horizon. So I used a tool called Portfolio Charts, and you can see the link down here at the bottom. It's portfoliocharts.com. It's under Portfolio and Withdrawal Rates, and this this is a great a great site to do this kind of a this kind of work. He's got a tool on there where you can set up your portfolio in terms of your equity allocation over here and your time horizon up here, 
And what he does is he has data from 1970 through 2019. What he does is he, he runs your retirement withdrawal scenario through every possible scenario that he can have, that, that you can have during those 30 years. And he looks at what your sustainable withdrawal rate would have been. In other words, what, what would have, have taken to not run out of money and what your perpetual withdrawal rate is. What kind of withdrawal rate would have supported having the same amount at the end that you had at the beginning? So in this particular case, with a three fund portfolio, and this will be a little bit hard for the people on the, on the, web, on the podcast to see, but for the, for the three fund portfolio, if you have 40% total stock market, 20% world market and 40% intermediate term bond for a 30 year horizon, your safe or sustainable withdrawal rate is four and a half percent. Your perpetual withdrawal rate and the four and a half percent will quote unquote guarantee you don't run out of money. There are no guarantees, but over this particular time horizon, you would not have run out of money. There was one case probably where you had zero, but the others were more than that. The perpetual withdrawal rate is 3.4%. That's less because you don't want to have zero. You want to have what you started with. So for a three fund portfolio, those are the rates. 4.5 for safe withdrawal rate, 3.4 for perpetual withdrawal rate. If you go and you look at, say, the US four fund now, we're 15% large blend, 15% large value, 15% small blend, 15% small cap value, and 40% intermediate term bonds. Again, over the same 30 year period, now your safe withdrawal rate is 5.3%. It was 5.3%. Your perpetual withdrawal rate is 4.4%. So that's your sub asset allocation or your, your asset class collection difference, if you will. So if you, if you look at several portfolios here, there's, there's the three fund and the US four fund with their 3.4 and 4.4 perpetual withdrawal rates. Look at the ultimate buy and hold it had a 3.9% withdrawal, perpetual withdrawal rate. The International Poor Fund, or the Trev H, as we've been calling it, has a 4.1% withdrawal rate, perpetual withdrawal rate. So you can see how with your different asset class selection for a 60-40 equity bond ratio over 30 years, you can see how your withdrawal rates change from sustainable withdrawal rates to perpetual withdrawal rates. Again, the thing to remember is that this only covers 1970 through 2019. And so for your, for your sort of standard portfolio that, that people think of when they're thinking about safe from perpetual withdrawal rates is a, is a total market and, and bond portfolio. So if you look at the, the three fund portfolio here, it's safe withdrawal rate is about four and a half percent. That's about a percent higher than typical number that's quoted of 4%. And part of that's because, well, it is because it doesn't include the time period that sets that 4% number typically, which is in the mid to late 60s. So if you're gonna use this tool to look at, at numbers, I would, I would maybe derate some of these numbers by about a half a percent just to be on the conservative side. So suppose this isn't what you wanna do in terms of asset allocation in, ter in terms of 60, 40 or 30 years horizon. So what is that? what happens if you vary those things? Well. If you move to a, a less equity position, say a 40-60 portfolio, your withdrawal rates will decrease. And for the people who are listening on the podcast, it's probably best to try to see if you can find some time to go look at the YouTube here. But you'll see as you go across these four portfolios and these two different withdrawal rates, they're all less. So decreasing equity allocation typically drives your withdrawal rates lower. You increase your equity allocation, then it has the opposite effect. Um, things get a little riskier at some point as you increase that. But uh, if you decrease your time horizon, the sustainable withdrawal rate increases because it has to support fewer years. But your perpetual withdrawal rate actually decreases because your goal is to have the same number of dollars you started out with. And so if you have a huge crunch right at the end, a drop right at the end, you need to have built up something to be able to deal with that drop and not fall below where you started to begin with. So your perpetual withdrawal rate will decrease as your time horizon decreases. If your time horizon increases, 
your perpetual withdrawal rate goes up because you've got a lot of time to potentially recover and build up a reserve to, to handle that dip at the end. But your soft or your software, <laughs> your sustainable withdrawal rate uh, goes down because it has to support withdrawals over a longer period of time. So if you go to a 40 year time horizon, these are the kind of numbers you see. So I don't know what this particular individual's time horizon was, what his risk tolerance, her, his or her risk tolerance was, um, how they felt about simple portfolios versus more diversified portfolios or more complex portfolios, don't know any of that. But using this tool at portfoliocharts.com uh, will allow you to go off and try to assess your own portfolio, what your sub-asset allocation is, what your equity bond allocation is, what your time horizon is, and you can get a feel for what you might, what kind of withdrawal rates you might be able to sustain both on, or take on both a sustainable basis and a, and a quote unquote perpetual basis. Perpetual being defined as the time period you are interested in. Great. I think, thanks. I think thanks, Daryl. All I Did have. Did you want to add, Chris? Uh, yeah, I really, I really like the tool that Daryl pointed to at portfoliocharts.com, and I would encourage anybody who's interested in this question on their own to go there and spend some time. Going back to the original question, what mix of assets are suggested for a retiree with the goal of asset preservation, which keeps up with inflation? I would, I would say uh, a short answer is diversified, you know, very diversified. And uh, that would be diversified across fixed income. Uh, so have, you know, have some in bonds so that you get some, some term risk exposure, some in stock, so you get market exposure, some in small in value, so you get diversified risk factor exposure. And, uh, you know, in the bonds, I agree with, with what Daryl said, that tips is a good way to help, especially in retirement, if you have some portion in tips to protect against inflation. Um, but I, I love the tool. I think the tool is a great thing because, you know, somebody asking a question like that is going to want to take either my answer or Daryl's and go play with it probably. So there you go, a place to play. And for Ooh. people who don't want to get too serious with playing, but want to see what just a small change uh, can have on a portfolio, what it will pay out. Uh, if you take the fine tuning table mm -hmm. that we show uh, with the S&P 500, for example, uh, along with different percentages of bonds and 10% increments, even if you can accept 20% in equities, it will go a long way to helping that portfolio uh, build some additional, the additional return that you need to deal with inflation. It doesn't take a lot. And uh, uh, so that's another easy thing to do. Number nine, in the Vanguard example, why is there a disproportionately lower increase in return as you go up in stock percentage, Chris? Do you know what this question was about? I do, I do. And it's it actually ties to what you just said about the fine tuning tables. If you go from a an all fixed income portfolio to one that has a little bit of stock in it, uh, you get a pretty significant bump in the expected return. And that bump comes early. It comes in the 20% to 40% range. You get a big jump in re expected return. As you go from that 40% equity position up to 80%, it's not as big a change. And the reason is that there's not much uh, horsepower in the engine of fixed income, if you will. So, you know, if you got a car that's just motivated entirely by fixed engine or, or by fixed income, it's not going to go very fast. Uh, if you have one that's that's motivated entirely by stocks, it has the potential to grow quickly, but it, it also might spend a long time stopped at the stoplight or even go in reverse for a while. Right. <laughs> so um, that big jump comes early because equities have so much higher expected return and they have this negative correlation with fixed fixed income, that return comes at different points in time. Uh, so you get a lot of bang for the buck in that early part of the curve. 
less bang for the buck in terms of total return later on. And it's just the nature of the beast. It's the way those two things add together when you, when you back test. The surprise that came out of the presentation I made, I think, is that as you also add in some small and some value, you can improve the return per risk, the return per unit of risk. And that was really core to the message that we delivered on Wednesday night. And uh, for people who want to have a deeper understanding of that, they should probably go back and watch the presentation. Okay, great. Thank you. Number 10. Is it viable to have the buy and hold strategy in a taxable account as well as in your tax deferred account? Or put another way, how much will taxes from rebalancing hurt my returns in a taxable account? All right, Daryl, you wanna take a whack? I can do that. Yes, it's valuable or it's valuable. <laughs> Yes, it may be valuable, but it is certainly viable. Um, and the way, to, the way to do that, I think, is to, to look at both accounts as one portfolio. Um, and then to remember that you don't have to have the same assets or asset classes in both accounts. Um, so the way this is a little bit like what my wife and I do. Uh, we balance, we look at our whole, whole portfolio or our whole across all our accounts as one portfolio and we have one account the one one account that's the 401k where mm -hmm. it's we have all our bonds in the 401k and we have the larger equity allocations in the 401k mm -hmm. um, and the reason we do that is because the primary rebalancing objective is to maintain your in my opinion is to maintain your risk profile in terms of bonds and equity fixed income and equity. And if you have your bonds in, in your tax deferred account and you have your larger equity allocations in your tax deferred account, it's easy to move between those two and get that balance, that equity allocation back in line. You've got big levers in that account to, to move those things around. Um, and you can do almost all your rebalancing in your tax deferred account. And then there are no tax consequences. Um, and in fact, you, you could almost make the argument that you could let your taxable account ride, depending on how much, what the difference in sizes in the two accounts are. Um, your, your smaller allocations um, and your more tax efficient uh, allocations could be in your taxable account. And you can use the distributions, the, the capital gains distributions or the dividends from those equity uh, holdings in your taxable account. You're going to pay taxes on those anyway. So you could use those to move around and do minor rebalancing in your taxable account. That's one way to do it. Chris, do you have any ideas on that? You look, you look. Well, if somebody has only, a, if they have all of their savings in a taxable account, um, then I, I, it's a different question. I really like what you said about a mix, and I think people should have a mix. I, I like that idea. Um, but if somebody does have everything in a taxable account, I, first of all, um, do, do it infrequently so that you get long-term capital gains instead of short-term gains. That'll help. Uh, if you live in a high tax state, and I think the person who asked this question did, uh, then that uh, that makes it, it, it gives you a disincentive for, uh, mm -hmm. for rebalancing. And in, in California, the maximum tax rate's 13%, that on top of 20%, you're up to a third, mm -hmm. right? So your gains yeah. that you're, you're trying to shift around, you know, if you're giving up a third of it, every time you shift it around, I'd say do it less frequently. Um, it's probably if you really want the highest return for the long term, you would just keep pushing it out and not rebalance and just bear the risk that, you know, you could do that, but um, it'll probably push you into a spot that's very risky. And unless you've got the appetite for that, then, then the rebalancing is going to make a lot more of a difference. So I, I think it, I love your idea of having a mix and I, 
uh, I think the vast majority of people will. They'll have some in a taxable account and some in a tax deferred account and be able to minimize the amount that they trade in the taxable account. And that's ideal. That's great. If you are stuck in an all taxable account, then you've really got to do a gut check about you yeah. know how important is the risk reduction versus the tax liability. Yeah, that gets back to where we talked earlier about your what's your risk profile? Yep. Need, ability, and, and I've got the other one. Um. Gentlemen, thanks. You've done it again. And uh, this, there's a lot of detail here. We know that for people listening to the podcast, that uh, you're probably going to want to go over and check out the uh, the graphs and things that that uh, Chris and 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 Daryl have put together, and we'll have links uh, to that work for you. Uh, this, you two guys offering your time has brought a whole new dimension, I think, to what the foundation is able to do to educate people who want to be do-it-yourself investors. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I know from the emails that I get uh, that uh, the people who are listening, uh, a number of them are really appreciative of what you guys are adding. Thank you both very much. Well, thank you, just, Paul. Uh, you're yeah, welcome. Fine. You certainly are. And we're getting closer and closer to the new book. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so it looks like early part of December, we'll be celebrating uh, all the hard work that Rich Buck has put in, uh, along with a little work from me. Uh, Christmas a, present. A, a Christmas present, a Hanukkah go. present, or whatever a present. Yeah. So what was that, Daryl? There you go. There you yeah. go. All right. Okay, you guys, you take care. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll be back next week trying to, trying to do it again. Good luck. Stay Thank well. You. you too.